James Mahelish, and I learned how to pronounce his name when he told me he was a hell of a guy, because I was mispronouncing it. Sid uh, or Bruce, a new friend. Uh, we got together through Senior Forum and Traveler's Rest Connection, and so I'm uh, glad that he consented to come to our history buff programs. Bruce grew up in historic Helena and Lewis and Clark County. As a kid, he was inspired by historians telling exciting stories of Lewis and Clark coming up the Missouri River. He earned a degree in business and minored in history at Montana State University. We forgive. <clears throat> he has. <laughs> He has earned a degree in business and minored, um, I'm sorry, he, he's been involved in a successful real estate and insurance ventures for the past 48 years. Western Montana has always been his home. Over the years, Bruce has uh, ground-proofed many sections of the Lewis and Clark Trail, foot by foot, boat, four-wheel drive, car, and horseback. That's pretty impressive. So he knows a lot about Lewis and Clark. Uh, the National Trail from Pittsburgh to Astoria has become his lifetime adventure. In 2009, Bruce retired to part-time work and joined the Corps of Volunteers at the Traveler's Rest State Park in Lolo, which I, if you haven't been there, you should always go there. Um, he earned his certificate of interpretation and became involved with several local and national Lewis and Clark organizations. Bruce was chosen, quote, State Parks Volunteer of the Year in 2014 and was recognized as, quote, Volunteer of the Year by Traveler's Rest in 2019. He continues to serve these causes today. His story of ponies and passes, which he gave to the senior forum that I'm a member of, so I said, we've got to get him here for a broader audience than just senior forum. Um, it focuses on the journey through the Missoula and Bitterroot Valleys. This dangerous section of the trail was all about horse, horse travel, and the Corps of Discovery's dependence upon indigenous assistance. Although the Corps was in this region for only a few short weeks, critical actions and strategies uh, here shaped the final outcome of the expedition. Their visit ultimately changed the face of Montana, the nation, and people's lives forever. Take it away, Bruce Mahalish. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? I got here an hour early to do this, but it didn't help. Much better. Can you hear me now? Good. Thank you. Hey, uh, thanks. For, this is a great turnout. Wow, I'm totally stunned and amazed. Um, I'd like to thank Lee for the invite. I'd like to thank the library for all the facility and, and technology help. And uh, it's always fun to be part of a bunch of history buffs like you guys. My purpose here today is to kind of enlighten you what happened with Lewis and Clark as they came through this area. And so I'm going to focus pretty much on the Bitterroot and Missoula valleys. That's 407 miles they went from the Missouri waters to the Columbia waters. And uh, it, it, every place you go around Missoula, you're crossing their path. Did you know when you drove down Higgins from the the Bear Tracks Bridge to the depot, you've crossed Meriwether Lewis's path? Did you know if you drove up Highway 12 to Lolo, you're crossing Lewis and Clark's path? How about 93 South? Well, you're going right where William Clark went. I-90, Lewis and Clark, Highway 200, Meriwether Lewis. So they're all over the place, and we're right in the midst of it. So I gotta make a quick disclaimer. I'm no scholar, I'm no college professor, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly haven't written a book, so I'm not gonna try to sell you a book tonight. Um, I'm just a local yokel that learned like indigenous people learned, through oral tradition. And I've got a lot of good friends, most of them live right here in Missoula, Montana, that taught me most of the things I'm going to share with you 
tonight. So I, you know, I, I'm just going to mention a few that I really gleaned a lot of information off and learned just by oral tradition. Harry Fritz, Al Stearns, Joe Musselman, Richie Doyle, Wayne Fairchild, who happens to be here tonight. Um, how about Norm Jacobs, Dale DeFore, Lauren Flynn, Tom Chenarts, Jack Puckett, Kim Brigaman. I know he's here today too. So those folks I've kind of absorbed like a sponge all that they know and I'm trying to condense this to one story for you tonight. We're really lucky here. We live at an ancient crossroads. I mean, Missoula just isn't a crossroads because we have highways going through today. The ancient people were using the, this, this trail all the way back 10, 15,000 years ago. So we've got to remember that. Now, I didn't hear a land acknowledgement tonight. Huh? So I'm going to do my own. I don't have it to read it, but I can tell you that we need to honor the people that were here first. They're still here. In fact, if you come out to Traveler's Rest, you can meet some of those folks. And, you know, these are all pictures of our local area. You recognize most of those. You can see Mount Sentinel and Mount Jumbo. Those people have been here for maybe 12,000 years. We're not real sure, but um, is obviously after L Glacier Lake Missoula drained. They wouldn't have been here before then. So anyway, we need to pay homage and honor to these folks. They took pretty good care of this land, and we inherited it. So um, that's my uh, land acknowledgement. It's a little informal, but you get the point. This was a great crossroads here, and the indigenous people felt the same way. There was five valleys that interconnected here and three rivers that rolled through. I'm told I got to look this way too, okay? <laughs> Sorry. This is a big room. I'm not used to two screens. That's for rock concerts, so I'm not sure what I'm doing here. But the indigenous people met here, you know, the Shoshone, the Bitterroot Salish, the Nez Perce, and even once in a while the Crow and the Blackfeet would sneak into town, along with the Ponderé. So there was lots of tribal people rolling through here for centuries. So most of this place has been really pre-established before Lewis and Clark. They weren't breaking trail. They were using old trails that have been here for centuries. So sometimes they get a little too much credit. And uh, we're going to start by looking at this map that Lewis had available to him in 1803. And you can see, I'll come over here so I can pay attention to you folks. You can see this spine that runs down that's supposedly the Rocky Mountains. This area right here where the 13 colonies are, obviously well mapped and well filled in. You can also see the Canada all the way across, almost to the Pacific, is well filled in. This is an Aerosmith map uh, made in London, and the, the, the British and the Hudson Bay Company brought most of this information back to Aerosmith. It might interest you to know that the Sweetgrass Hills, Haystack Butte, the Nose of the Sleeping Giant, or the Bear Tooth, Bear's Tooth, are all on this map, and there's no white men that's ever been in this area. They got it from French and uh, Blackfeet traders up here in Saskatchewan, and then they, they filled in this piece. Obviously, they got the spine of the mountains kind of wrong. This is called the Mastakis by the Blackfeet. It's the backbone of the world. But obviously, they missed about 50 other mountain ranges that are on either side of that. 
Oh, this little map down here is just to show you the theory right after the Revolutionary War was that this was the river of the West and it would connect to the Missouri River coming up from St. Louis. And of course, the hope or the theory was that you could float all the way to the Pacific. And that's, that's when Meriwether Lewis took off in 1803, that was, that was the hope. That obviously didn't happen because they hit this land bridge that we're talking about tonight. This is the core of the Discovery's trip through Montana. They covered more miles in Montana than any other state. They were coming and going. They were splitting up into small numbers. They were doing some real silly stuff that was probably not smart. But they did make it, they did make it home. So uh, the center, here's Traveler's Rest, right about here. OK? So that's the center of our story tonight. All right, so Jefferson's looking to fund this expedition with Congress, and he needs to sensationalize a little bit to get some money, right? So he's talking about all these giant beasts out there in the West that we've got to go find. We've got to do a scientific expedition and discover these guys, these giant mastodons, these giant bears, giant sloths. You, they were certain there was giant sloths out here. And, you know, saber-toothed tigers. Now, they were somewhat accurate on this. Those animals actually did exist, and they existed right here in this area. Problem is, they're about 10,000 years late. So they disappeared with the Ice Age, um, for the most part, as did the horses. Um, I always like to point out, this is uh, Mount Jumbo, and you can really see the lap lines or the striations from Glacial Lake Missoula there. That's the best photo I've ever found. But the sale was, to Congress was, you know, there's these huge mountains, there's these great plains, there's all these resources. We gotta go figure this place out. So they did. So the horses are a big part of our story tonight. And the reason why is because if it wasn't for the horses, Lewis and Clark probably would have gone home early. They would have probably got to about the Three Forks and decided to turn around and come home. But there was hope there was horses out here with the, the native people, the indigenous folks. These are where horses started uh, 50 million years ago. Can anybody tell me where the horse originated, where it evolved? North America? Anybody want to say Africa or Asia? No, no. Asia? Got an Asia here. <laughs> North America. But they suddenly went extinct about 10,000 years ago after the last ice age. We're not sure why. We don't know if it was climate change or the, the man over hunted them, but they did disappear. Notice in these slides that most of these animals are striped. So I don't know if the zebra came first or the horse came second, second or I don't know which one came first, the chicken or the egg, but most of these animals were striped. There was an American zebra. Um, they, they evolved, this, this is also a north, this was a big horse, this was as big as a Clydesdale. Um, the other animals that evolved on the American, North American plains were the llama and the camel. All right, and how about this? These guys have similar DNA to the horse, called a rhinoceros. And they've been tested and their DNA is very close. Now, those guys end up in Africa. I don't, that was quite a migration. Um, the camels followed the horses to Asia. And, of course, the llamas went south to South America. I think they're all avoiding man, but uh, 
I, I could be wrong. It could be climate as well. So here's what the horse does over 50 million years. It starts out as the Eohippus. It's a small dog-like creature. It's got spots. And they found uh, fossils of these guys in Wyoming. So they're, they're uh, real close to where we're at. As they got out on the Great Plains and quit eating trees and shrubs and started eating grass, they grew bigger and taller. Now, this only took 50 million years. But they're almost to the regular size we see today, um, oh, uh, 5 million years ago. So from 5 million to 50 million to 5 million. One thing that's interesting is this Eohippus had four toes. So each generation that went through this evolution lost a toe. So finally they end up with one foot, one hoof. Doesn't that just get you jazzed up? <laughs> so 10,000 years ago, glacier ice sheets melt. People are heading into this country. And the horses are heading out. So they take this 10,000 mile trip around the world. And uh, you can see that there was probably two migration paths. There was this one that went north into Asia and uh, Russia and then uh, northern Europe and Spain down to Italy up to the, the British Islands. And then there was a southern route that went into Asia, China, India, the Middle East, and then over to North Africa. So that's how horses evolved on the other side of the world. Somewhere along the line, they got domesticated. Remember, they were all getting hunted for food, right? But these people over in the Ukraine, of all places, in Kazakhstan, decided you know what, if I stick a rope on these guys, they might be good for something else. And that's when they became beasts of burden about five to 7,000 years ago. And if you think about where that area is located, it's a nice central location between Western Europe and China. And so it's kind of the middle. And so those horses start spreading out as domestic. And then you think about civilizations, they all evolved, they all became great civilizations on the back of a horse. As the history of man goes, so does the horse. You know, Rome, Greece, Egypt, Persia, you could, you could go on forever, but no great civilization really made it without the horse. Now, somewhere along the line they lost their glamour it's about the time Henry Ford came along. And now think about this. You go back in your own family and think of somebody, maybe it's a great-grandparent or a grandparent, that depended on a horse to make their way through life. Whether they were farmers or ranchers or I had a grandfather that worked in the smelters in Butte. And they, they hauled around all those lead pots with the horse. Those horses went down a mile deep into the mines in Butte. So we had to have those guys. And then somebody invents this thing called the automobile and they fall out of favor. In uh, World War I, there's somewhere, it's, it's kind of a guess, eight to 10 million horses died in World War I. Eight to 10 million. That's incredible. A lot of them came from North America from the Yellowstone River Valley. Um, they were sh getting shipped over there in droves. So anyway, uh, Fido takes the place as a man's best friend and the horse is out of favor now. I, I love to ask these kids that are on the cell phone all day and know how to fix technology and all that if they know how to saddle a horse. Because a lot of them don't. You know, I don't know, well, my kids do. My, my wife made sure of that. <laughs> so, 
Hey, by the way, I, was, I, I wanted to point out that my, my wife and children are both here, so they must have gotten over me talking about this at the dinner table. <laughs> Um, and I really appreciate their support. So thanks for for coming. I missed it wasn't in my notes, so I had to wing that. What's man's greatest invention? Well, some people say the wheel. Some people say the sailboat to get people around the world. I say it's rope, because without rope, a horse ain't no good. It just doesn't work. Um, even today, if your horse gets loose, you better go get the halter because he's not going to come into the barn without it. So that's what rope did for us. Greatest invention. So fast forward. Now we're at 711 AD, and there's a civilization down North Africa that really took root and uh, was really sophisticated. The Moors, and they invaded Spain. They also invaded uh, France and Italy. But they, they took Spain over for 700 years. And they brought their horses with them. And their war horses were these Spanish barb horses. Barb, Barbary Coast, okay? So they come from North Africa and become the horse of choice for the military. Now they haven't interesting anatomy. They're, they're smaller than the horses we know of today. A horse we know of today is roughly 15 hands high. A hand is four inches. All right, so you measure from the ground up to the top of the shoulder blade, the withers, and that's the height of your horse. Well, uh, Spanish bars were probably around 13 hands high. So they were four to eight inches shorter. But that's all good for a war horse. You know, they're compact, they're sturdy, they're solid, and uh, they have especially strong feet, which means they don't need to be shod. So that was uh, kind of a low maintenance horse. They also have an interesting anatomical feature. They're the only horse in the world, only breed in the world, that has one less vertebrae than all other horses. They have lum uh, a lumbar vertebrae that's right here, and they have five instead of six. That's just the way they evolved. By the way, their cousin, the Arabian horse, that also comes from North Africa, they say they have five and a half vertebrae. So that's the other oddball, is the Arabian horse. That's still a very popular breed. <clears throat> so the Moors get kicked out of Spain around mm, 1450. And then 1492, you know what happens. Um, Christopher Columbus comes along, goes to work for Spain, and uh, sails the ocean blue. On his second voyage, am I beeping? Oh, okay. On his second voyage, he brings over a load of horses. And he drops them off either in the Dominican Republic or Cuba. 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 Right, Wayne? Yeah. So the horse starts returning to North America. Now, over the next hundred years, the Spanish are bringing shiploads full of horses into the Mexican mainland. And they start migrating up into the, what today is the southwest United States, into Texas. And they, I mean, they multiply like rabbits. And they are all over the place. By 1680, in New Mexico, the uh, Indians overthrew the uh, Spanish people. And all of a sudden, all these horses are available. And they start working their way up up to uh, Montana. So there was a couple of migrations path. Now, some of these horses were traded for, but most of them were stolen. One tribe after another got the hint. 
and they figured out, these Spanish had something figured out, these horses weren't for food, they were for carrying things. And so by the time the mid-1700s arrived, about five, 50 years before Lewis and Clark showed up, uh, most all tribes in uh, uh, Mont even Canada and up in Montana have, have horses. And Lewis and Clark are aware of this. So they went from dogs to elk dogs. All right, back to Lewis and Clark. Guys, what's, what's this guy talking about horses for? Um, Lewis and Clark used horses all the way from Pittsburgh down to St. Louis, up the Missouri to Fort Mandan the first two years. All right? So, and they're basically using horses for hunting to provide food for the Corps of Discovery. So, here's my first big, what are you doing here, Meriwether? After they left the winter at Fort Mandan, brought Sacagawea with them for Mandan, they left with no horses. There's plenty of horses at Mandan. I mean, plenty of them. They brought some into the Mandan camp. They must have left those behind. But they had plenty of opportunity to pick up horses. The Mandan people had told Lewis and Clark that there was a big falls up there somewhere. And you think Lewis would have processed, well, maybe we should take some horses along so we, we can haul around these falls. But um, that, that was one of what I think is one of his first blunders. Now, I'm not here to criticize Meriwether Lewis. They were brilliant. They were geniuses. They were lucky. But there were some mistakes along the way we need to be aware of, too. I think this is one of them. Where were the, where were the indigenous people? Where were they? They went from Fort Mandan all the way into the Beaverhead Valley over a thousand miles. They didn't see one. They saw signs of horses. They saw signs of indigenous lodges, but they never did see any indigenous people. And you can look at that map there. You can see all the tribal people they, they ran through. They went by the Assiniboine, the Sioux, the Grovan, the Crow, um, probably the Salish and, and Ponderé, and, and down into Shoshone country. But there wasn't any of them there. I can't tell you why that is. I think they were uh, watching the whole, the whole time. But I also think they saw 33 people down there on, on, the, on the river and decided, eh, that's a little too much to take on. So I think they left them alone. So they get to the Great Falls. There's all, there's all sorts of things that happen in between here. I'm kind of skipping through this. And they run into this 18-mile portage that they have to take around the falls. And they have to do it with manpower. There's no horses to, to take it around. So it's like, I don't know if that was a good idea. That held them up a month. It took them a full month, the full month of June, to get around the falls. So that gets them coming into this area a little late. It's almost winter by the time they get here. Finally, they get down into the Beaverhead, get near the Continental Divide. And they run into uh, Sacagawea's people. Now, does it offend anybody if I call her Sacagawea? You want to call her Sacagawea? I am told by the Shoshone people, you better call her Sacagawea. Now, if you're in North Dakota, that's all wrong. So, they uh, run into Sacagawea's people. They're standing up on Lim High Pass and looking across, and all Lewis sees is more mountains. He's thoroughly depressed. Um, Drewyer, who is their number one guide, uh, said he had a good view of their horses and estimated them to be about 400, and they're all fine horses. Lewis said they were as fine a horses as they'd ever seen on the James, James River in Virginia. And then 
you know, then Lewis kind of gets a little down, goes, we should be obliged to climb over steep and rocky mountains where we would find no game to kill. So he, he's kind of getting a little bit anxious, and rightly so. So negotiations open with this chief by the name of Kamiowait. And uh, just so happens, most of you know this story, but that's Sacagawea's brother. The chief of the Shoshone is Sacagawea's brother. So that had to have some positive impact on horse trade. You know, here's, here's Camille Way looking at his nephew, Jean-Baptiste, um, going, isn't this nice? By the way, Sacagawea had a man in the Shoshone camp that she was... Uh, what would you call it? A, a marriage had been arranged when she was about five or ten years old. Um, fortunately, she stayed with the Corps of Discovery. Here's another place where I think things were kind of goofy. Um, what motivated these indigenous people was that these people from the United States were carrying guns. What motivated them to be so generous with their horses was that they could trade for guns. The Blackfeet had driven these poor people into the mountains and been bullying them around. And so if these people could provide guns for them, that would even up the score. And Lewis said, yeah, th that can happen, but give us the horses first, and then we'll... We'll be back with guns. So it didn't quite work out the way that Camille Waite wanted it to. So here we are. Now we're crossing passes. This is the con first pass of the Continental Divide. Clark's on one side of the divide, and Lewis is on the other with, with uh, Camille Waite. So they're passing back and forth from... Everybody knows where the Clark Canyon Dam is. Okay, that's where Clark's stowing away the canoes. And then on the other side, Lewis is in the Lemhi Valley in today's Idaho. And they're crossing back and forth five times. I don't know if you've ever been up to Lemhi Pass. How many people have been to Lemhi Pass? How'd you like to walk that five times in, in two weeks? I don't think I would. I mean, it's comparable to being walking over Rogers Pass. So anyway, they uh, got their horses. Uh, Sacagawea got her own privately owned horse, and off they, they head. They've got 30 horses, 29 military horses, and one privately owned horse from Sacagawea. Did I hear somebody agree with that? There's a controversy on that. Okay, I know we've got a lost trail pass expert in here, um, but old Toby, the guide that was provi provided to them by Kamiwe, Shoshone chief, got to the bottom of Lost Trail Pass and pointed them up the road where Gibbonsville, Idaho is today, and they wanted them to go back into the big hole and then over what we call today Gibbons Pass. Well, Lewis declined that offer. He wanted to go straight into the Bitterroot. So he cut across, went straight, straight north, and here's what Clark says on September 2nd. It's snowing, it's cold, it's wet. We were obliged to cut a road over rocky hillsides where our horses were in pitiful danger of slipping to their certain destruction. They lost seven horses um, on this on this little route here, uh, another question mark on some decisions that were getting made. I mean, listen to the guide; it's what he's for. So that's that's a good example of Lost Trail. There's these big shale slides up there. Um, you can see the ski area right there. Um, I a tour with a fellow by the name of Ted Hall, and uh, the, the trail is supposedly goes right along the bottom of those ski ski runs and then down. Um, this is 
the, the Sula, Ross's whole Sula Valley right there. So you can see how rough it was. I mean, there, there's no trail. The, the Indians didn't use this. There's Gibbon Pass. That, there's the pass they missed. Gibbons, I've, I've been up there uh, driving around with Pam, and uh, it's not a bad path. It goes right down into the big hole, and uh, you feel fairly safe up there. It gets a little dicey in the winter, I bet. So they drop down into Sula Valley, and there's a second group of, of Indians, the Salish, the Bitterroot Salish. And they're just ready to pull up stakes and head for Three Forks, and go hunting. They're out of meat, but they still share what they have for food with Lewis and Clark. And they, they warm them up with, with buffalo robes. And I mean, this is, this is a, a friendly group of people. In fact, I think, what's Private White House say here? The Indians were the handsomest, most likely Indians that we have seen yet. So the Bitterroot Salish were, uh, we're saviors. And if you look at, uh, this is a, a recent photo, you can see a Volkswagen there, I think. Um, it still kind of looks like it did when Lewis and Clark came through. Um, you, I mean, it's, there's a couple ranches out there with some haystacks, but um, it's pretty much, I think that's the East Fork right there, East Fork of the Bitterroot. So um, if you, if you want to go to a place that Kind of appears to be what, what it was 200 years ago. Pretty close. Now we're getting close. They're coming up the Bitterroot Valley, and they're coming up the east side. So they're coming up the east side highway. Okay, and they, they camp in Hamilton, and then they camp the next night in Stevensville. Right? right just, just south of Stevensville, there's a campsite. And the reason I know this is because I can read Clark's maps and he tells us where they stay. But um, it was kind of a nasty walk. It was cold and wet the whole time. It was raining. It was early September. Um, it was snowing up in the mountains. It was raining down in the valleys. So, and there was no food. There was no food. They were, they were beginning to starve. So this wasn't a pleasant trip for them. This is Clark's map. Now, just to get your orientation straight, on the far left there, that's about where Sula is. And you can see these notes, encamped 6th of September. And then you can see these little dotted lines here. This is about where the East Side Highway is today. You know, here he calls this valley Horse Valley because they're seeing a lot of wild horses here. But, but you can see exactly their path. Right here where this map ends is about where Lolo is. So Florence is right here, Hamilton right there, Stevensville is right here. He called that Scatter Creek. What, what are all those crick burnt forks down in Stevensville now? Yeah. Absolutely, what do, what do you wanna see the most? This is Lolo, okay, and uh, here's, here's Stevensville, right about here. He has a flag, where, where is that now? I can't, I gotta stand back. Oh, that's his camp at Stevensville right there. Right there, it's right on, on the east side of the river. Again, those dots are the path that are carrying them up this way. Now when Clark returns in 1806 in this valley, he goes straight down where Highway 93 is today on the other side of the river. Okay, so this isn't the only time Sergeant Gass called these horrible mountains. He called them horrible and terrible and he did not like the Bitterroot Mountains. And he let everybody know it. And they were an obstacle. I mean, they'd been coming up this valley for, for over 100 miles now, and they can't get through them. Old Toby gets them here. This is like a big neon sign, Lolo Peak. It's like, turn left here. 
turn left here. And this is the gap through the mountains. You can see low, this, I took this picture from uh, uh, Traveler's Rest. But there's the gap, there's Lolo Peak. And this is the gap Toby tells him that we want to go through. Now, did anybody wonder why they turned left other than Toby? A lot of people ask, why didn't they just keep going up the Bitterroot and go up the Clark Fork River system, right? I mean, that's logical. Well, old Toby told him for one thing. And finally, Lewis learned his lesson on Lost Trail Pass, right? But uh, no salmon. The, the indigenous people called that place no salmon, Tim Sim Clay. That's the only Salish word I can say, so don't ask me anymore. Actually, I know Spetlam, too. That's the bitter root. But that's why they didn't continue up the Clark Fork River system. They needed to go down the Clark Fork <laughs> River system. I'm, I'm sorry, Kim. So here's this ancient crossroads. Lolo, Traveler's Rest, has been there for centuries. It's a major stop-off point for indigenous people. They traded there, they camped there. So, again, Lewis and Clark aren't camping in any place special. There's probably already fire rings set up for them. It's like a regular national park campground. So uh, they camped there, and they stayed there, decided to rest. They were there September 9th, 10th, and left on the 11th. That's what Traveler's Rest looked like in about 1850. And you can see Clark's maps interconnected. And I, I think this is one of the neatest things that Clark did is once he finished one map, he would next make sure the next map would meet it. So you can come up here and you're coming up the, the Bitterroot River and you can see these little tracks. This is where Traveler's Rest was, encamped 9th and 10th, 1805. And you can see these tracks going up to, the, to that hot springs that's still there, Lolo Hot Springs. It's still there. So he put little tick marks on his maps so you could make them join. Or you put them together and they all make sense. So you could get into a gymnasium, put all his maps together, and, and go all the way from Fort Mandan to, to Fort Clatsop. I can't get into Traveler's Rest. You need to come out and listen more about this thing. But this was all about uh, sanitation, order, and discipline. And uh, when they set up a formal camp, that always was the case. Uh, and that's what led to the archaeology. The archaeologists figured out that they were running this von Steuben type camp. And they found the latrines cook fires and lead and mercury and it all traces back to Lewis and Clark come on out to the, the travelers rest you can actually see the lead um, and uh, we can talk a little bit more about how that all came about then they went over this Northwest Passage we call it it's a land bridge goes from travelers rest up and over down to Wee Eye Prairie in Oregon if you've never been up there, I would recommend you do it because it's, first of all, it's beautiful. My, my friend Robert over here just did it. But if you really want to do it right, do it with Wayne Fairchild down there in the back here. He'll take you up in style and he'll feed you right. Um, my wife's never forgiven him. Pam's never forgiven Wayne because Wayne said, oh, it's just like walking up the M when you walk up Windover Ridge. And uh, it's not like walking up, it's like walking up 20 M's. And so anyway, um, I think they uh, made, kissed and made up on that one. So Sprint to the Sea, Fort Clatsop, you know, they're back in canoes again. They left their horses, 38 horses with, uh, the Nez Perce people. 
<clears throat> so the Nez Perce people are the third tribe that save the Lewis and Clark expedition because they feed and they stuff them full of salmon and roots. They get a little bit upset tummies, but they, uh, it did help them survive, and they pointed them in the right direction. So when they came back in June 1806, they recovered 36 of the 38 horses they'd left there. And they asked the Nez Perce where the other two horses went. They said, oh, well, that's old Toby and his son took those back to Idaho. I don't know what happened to them. But um, when they came through Traveler's Rest in 1806, they had 67 ponies. 67. To me, that's, I, I can't hang on to two horses, let alone 67. And... Uh, they, they also had five Nez Perce guides, and the Nez Perce had been really helpful in making them maps to show how they could cross over the, the divide. Those are the Nez Perce maps that are drawn, and uh, uh, this, the, it's just not visible enough to explain all those, but I can tell you that this map runs from Idaho over Lolo Pass and out into the Missouri River. And it shows you Marias Pass. It shows you Lewis and Clark Pass, Rogers Pass, Lewis and Clark Pass, uh, McDonald Pass, Pipestone Pass. Um, all those passes that we still use today in our highways are on these maps. Right here, these are Nez Perce maps from 1806. They get into Montana. They were at Lolo Hot Springs on the way back. They all jumped in and had some nice hot baths and got refreshed. Lewis and Clark had a contest to see who could stay in the hot water the longest. And Lewis actually won. He beat Clark, I think, by a couple of minutes. Clark couldn't handle it. So they were having a little fun on the way home. Then they got here in, uh, at Traveler's Rest in Lolo and this is when they uh, planned, and they, this was a pre-plan that started at Fort Clatsop to, to split up. I mean, there's lots of things that need to get done yet. They need to find the shortest route to the Great Falls now because there is no river passage. That whole Northwest Passage thing has, is a dream, and it, it didn't come true, so we got to find the best passage. Well, you all recognize this, right? Anybody lost here? That's Hellgate Canyon. All right, you're looking. At, you're in the Missoula Valley, so. Uh, huh? Well, we're going to get to the M. All right. <laughs> Good point. Um, but that's that's 1854. John Mix Stanley. Here's another shot. Um, this is called. That's Hellgate. I've seen some. They call this Devil's Gate. So. Uh, Lewis has got to find this short passage to the falls. The Nez Perce, Old Toby have all said, hey, you're, you're less than a week from the Great Falls here at Traveler's Rest. So he heads that way. And they send Lewis, or I mean, I'm sorry, Clark. They send him south down to the Yellowstone. And so uh, he goes right through Bozeman Pass and down into today's Livingston and jumps on the Yellowstone River, jumps along. He's got 50 horses still. So he's taken a big herd of horses all the way across country, and the purpose of that was to trade the Mandan for goods so they could get out of Fort Mandan uh, with supplies. Well, didn't quite work out as they thought. Um, probably the crow. They never identified these folks, but they came in over a series of two nights and uh, stole all 50 horses. So the, the, the crow have a lot of fun telling us that <laughs> in their, their stories that, uh, hey, we got your horses. All right, here's where it comes really familiar. Lewis Leaves Traveler's Rest on July 3rd. And he heads south down Highway 93, right across from where a lot of you people walk your dogs, Blue Mountain. All right? 
comes, cuts right off of 93 and across, probably comes up Hayes Creek. We don't know for sure. And then he drops off of Blue Mountain down along the river. And the McClay Bridge was closed at that time as well. <laughs> and then they have to cross the Clark's Fork about where uh, Kelly Island is. All right, where the two rivers come together. They had a little problem crossing. There, one of those rafts flew down stream, and Lewis was on it, and they hit some brush and bushes on the other side, kind of tip. Lewis takes a swim. So they end up somewhere along about where Kona Bridge is today. And then they came back up and camped on Grant Creek. So they're just uh, oh, a couple miles west of today's Walmart. OK. The Nez Perce guides, there's five of them, they easily cross. They just swam their horses and put some of their supplies in uh, animal skins. Uh, Clark's wor or Lewis is working his tail off building rafts, so it took him most of the day. So on July 4th, July 4th, 1806, the United States is 30 years old, right? That's when Lewis and his nine men and 17 horses go right down through downtown Missoula today. Now, we really don't know what street they used. <laughs> the old school says they went right down Front Street. Um, I'm from a newer school that thinks they probably went down Pine or Spruce, a little, little bit to the north. But wherever they went, they had to cross the rattlesnake, right? So the reason I say maybe not front is because at that time, the rattlesnake was a big delta. Had lots of slushy material and swampy. And so I'm thinking they came up, up the stream a little bit, maybe to where the railroad is today or Pine or Spruce, somewhere in that area. Nobody can prove anything there. All right, so here's East Missoula, right? And you're looking back, here's Sentinel, and here's the backside of Jumbo. So they came right down this avenue, probably Speedway Drive today, not the highway, but Speedway. And there's a reason for that. There was a hill called Brickyard Hill that probably interfered with the road on, going towards on the other side of Speedway. And then... You can see here, this is on top of Mount Sentinel. This is East Missoula. And then they curved around the bottom of this hill and went um, over to what we call today Riverside and then um, Bonner. This is a good old map that shows, shows Missoula, what is it, 1890 something. So I imagine this to be Lolo Peak. And if you kind of trace my, this is where they would have gone. There's Blue Mountain. This is along the river. And then this is where the Bitterroot flows in. Kelly Island would be right about here. So they crossed right about here, came out and camped on Grant Creek. And that's on July 3rd, the evening of July 3rd. And then they came down here to where the city is now today and cross the rattlesnake. See all this stuff going on down here at the bottom of rattlesnake? These are all little streams. So I'm, I don't know, I'm guessing that they were up in here somewhere. But this is how they came down and around. Let's see, where, where's Walmart? Right about there. There's Walmart today. So you get your orientation straight. Everybody knows where Walmart is, right? All right, here's where there's more, maybe more clues. Everybody knows that William Clark carved his name in Pompey's Pillar in the stone, right, in the sandstone. And you can go down there and still see his name. So there's evidence that William Clark was there. 
They didn't camp there. They had lunch there. So he took the time to do that. Well, there's some of us theorize that this M and this L might mean something else other than Montana and Loyola. Huh? What do you think? Mary Weather Lewis. Might have been Dick Slesic, I don't know. This is, the, this is the artist that's called this Devil's Gate. Again, it's the same. There's Jumbo and there's uh, Sentinel. So I haven't lost anybody of where we're at, right? I mean, it's, it's Missoula. Now, as you get out of town and you get past Milltown and Bonner, they built this big, new, beautiful facility, and it's right on the river. The river's right down here. And this railroad track, you got to remember, what didn't exist. That was made by some nice machinery back, you know, in the early 1900s. But Lewis was always on that side of the river. So he wasn't on the highway side that we know today. He was on the other side. And he had to negotiate all these hills and rocks and cliffs. And uh, they actually think he came right through this saddle and then basically down to the river. But it was an up and down trip. This is a narrow corridor. It still is today. And it's, it's full of trees. And it's just tough going. But, but they're, they're making the nine men and the 17 horses. They're making about uh, 25 to 30 miles a day. They got from Walmart to seven miles up from Bonner on, on the uh, 4th of July. And I don't know if they stopped for ice cream at, <laughs> in Missoula or not. Um, this is the valley, what, uh, Prairie of the Knobs. This is Ovando area. And they camped um, uh, at Ovando. Here's the bridge. Uh, here's Highway 200. And they, right at the mouth of what we call Montour Creek today, they camped right there. They, they named it after their dog, Seaman. It was Seaman's Creek then. Today it's Montour Creek. It's right along Highway 200. So you can, you can drive and look at that. This place right here is called the Ellis Creek Drainage. And this is Lewis and Clark Pass right here. You get to the top of this ridge and you look out, you can see all the way to Great Falls. It's a beautiful sight. So um, they were up there on, what, July 6th. Along the way, there's my friend Richie Doyle and I. Along the way, there's rock carns. There's, there's uh, what, what, the, what we call Indian trees, scarred trees. Um, they're all along that route um, because this was the road to the buffalo. This wasn't just Lewis's route. This was the road to the buffalo. Question? Okay, so did I? I think I skipped a slide. The rest of their route was, as I say here, chaotic, calamitous, and clumsy. Lewis goes up north. He's looking for the northern boundary of Louisiana. He also wants to meet up with the Blackfeet to make sure he can establish relations with them. Didn't go so good. Um, some of the young Blackfoot kids who were involved in this incident were probably 14, 15 years old. They, they, they shot and killed one. One got stabbed. So there was one, maybe two Blackfeet that died. Um, bad scene. Um, down at the Great Falls, Ordway's crew there getting chased up trees by grizzly bears <laughs> and uh, just having a heck of a time with the bears. And then D Clark's losing all his horses down on the Yellowstone. So, you know, why was that? And again, the strategy, I think, was poorly chosen. They had to split up to find with all the things that they still wanted to report back to the president on. But because they were in small numbers, 
And they were carrying horses this time, not canoes. And horses are like magnets for raids, right? So when you're carrying horses along the river, and then you've got guns on top of that, what do you think? You think you're going to attract a crowd? Well, they finally did. Remember, they didn't see one in 1805. But when they had horses, they, they did. By the way, Lewis got shot in the rear end by his old man, uh, old man, uh, Cruzette, the one-eyed boatman. Um, he he uh, thought he was an elk, I guess. And anyway, Lewis uh, had to go face down in his canoe for uh, several hundred miles before he could sit again. So by the time they get to the confluence of the Yellowstone, they're all in the Navy, the Navy again. Actually, uh, they started in boats. Lewis started in boats near the Marias and Clark near where Billings is today, closest. And so they're... They're in their comfort zone again. I don't think these, these guys were real good horse people. I mean, I, they were pretty good with their canoes and their boats, but I'm not sure they were trained cavalry. So they become national icons when they get to St. Louis, and Lewis and Clark are definitely the most famous of all our explorers. You know, there's other explorations going on right now. Zebulon Pike's out in uh, Colorado, finding Pike's Peak, and then he's going down into New Mexico, and he got captured by the Spanish. That's a whole other story. And uh, Freeman and Custis are down there exploring Texas. Jefferson's got all these reconnaissance mission going out, trying to figure out what he bought. So it wasn't just Lewis and Clark. I'm saying one of the reasons that Lewis and Clark were so became so famous as they kept good journals. And these maps, these are all calculations by Clark, just meticulous records on how, to, how he was going to build his maps. And so, and it was, it was more than Lewis and Clark. There was Floyd, Ordway, Gass, and Whitehouse all keeping records, just not Lewis and Clark. We think at least two more were keeping records, but they haven't been uncovered. They've been lost. Sergeant Pryor, and uh, Private Frazier. Uh, Frazier's another story for another day, but he tried to publish a map that was all wrong, and he got in trouble with Captain Lewis, and uh, this, this is after they got back. This is uh, Clark's map that was finally finished in 1814. Remember that one spine of mountains we saw in that Aerosmith map? Whoops. Kind of changed a little, didn't it? So um, this was a map that was widely accepted for about 50 years until the uh, rest of these explorers got out. Um, but, but it's fairly accurate. Just to get your orange, there is the confluence of the Yellowstone and the Missouri right there. Fort Mandan's right here. St. Louis is right down here in the bottom right-hand corner. Here is the mouth of the Columbia. So this is the whole route. Traveler's Rest would be right about there. Right about there. Missoula would be right about here. Here's the Bitterroot Valley right there. You can see all those little streams coming out. That's the Bitterroot. So Missoula, Missoula Valley is this right here. Obviously, they found lots of flora and, and fauna. The... Uh, main thing they found was, uh, or the fam most famous thing they found was the bitterroot flower. And they found that right here at uh, Lolo. And obviously, um, they came up with some new species. I didn't know this until recently, but mule deer was a species discovered by Lewis and Clark. Um, and, of course, the, the big star of the show is the grizz, right? The white bear. Um, and lots of legends came off of that. Um, bighorn sheep, swift fox, mountain goats, and pronghorns. Um, I thought everybody knew what a pronghorn was back east, but they didn't. 
So um, let's talk about the success they had. Of course, this really kicks off Manifest Destiny, right? And uh, we could talk about Manifest Destiny, but that didn't benefit all the people <laughs> in the world. A lot of displaced people come about. When you talk to some people that are indigenous, they don't get quite as excited about Lewis and Clark as maybe I do. And I don't blame them. It changed their lives forever. These maps are per precursor to the reservation system. And the reason I show this map, see this little oblong circle right here? That's the Bitterroot Valley. That was set aside for the Bitterroot Salish. How'd that go? Yeah, it didn't. So there's, you know, you got to think about the other people that are involved in this thing, too. Of course, the road of the buffalo has been closed down as a result of this. Um, okay, after Lewis and Clark, this is just a fact. 60,000 dead bears and 30 million bison. Poof. I mean, 100 years after they come through, this is what happens. So um, it wasn't all progress. But that's the bad news. Good news is they were raving successes, especially for the president. And we talk about this a lot out at Traveler's Rest, but this was a diversified crew. A lot of the expeditions that went out in the West were pure military. These guys were a mix and match, a hodgepodge of different people. They had, uh, what was it, nine men from Kentucky that were just plain old woodsmen. They weren't military. They had York, who was Clark's slave. He added a whole new dimension. And then, um, obviously, the Indian woman and her baby. Um, well, that's a first. I mean, what would a military group be doing with a, with a, with a Shoshone woman and her baby? Then you got Camille Waite, you got three eagles from the Salish, you got these Nez Perce chiefs that are helping out. And this guy is not military. His name was Druyard. He was Shawnee and French Canadian. So it's really a diversified bunch of folks. This guy right here, there's the guy that shot Lewis in the rear end. His name's Cruzette. He played the fiddle. I, I always remember my friend Richie Doyle saying that, uh, you know, when they couldn't understand each other, the one universal thing they had was music around the campfire. And I, I believe that uh, maybe calmed some nerves a lot along the trail. Cruzette, there was a couple other fiddle players too. So it was, it was a very diversified group. Got to give credit to the indigenous folks, obviously Sacagawea, Camille Waite, her brother, and then think about the Shoshone people and providing 30 horses um, and two, two guides, old Toby and his son. Uh, I just call him Toby now. I, I don't call him old anymore. Um, Chief Three Eagles from the Salish people who, who told the Salish people, we're going to help these people, we're going to feed them, do them no harm. So three eagles. By the way, he's grandfather to uh, Victor and Charlo. Three eagles. Close enough, right? The Nez Perce um, had some interesting names. Twisted hair, cut nose, red grizzly. What Wetkawis was a woman. And she called anybody that wanted to hurt Lewis and Clark and the men, the Corps of Discovery, what could we said, no, you're not going to do that. And the reason why is she'd been helped by some white people when she'd been kidnapped over in the Great Lakes country. And she got back to her people. And what could we said, no, we're going to help these folks out. They, they helped me out. And then the chiefs provided six guides. By the way, those guides got to Hellgate Canyon and said, see ya. We're, not, we're done. And the reason why, they're they're deadly fear the, the Blackfeet. So uh, somewhere in downtown Missoula, they turned around and maybe they went and got ice cream at the Big Dipper. 
I don't know. And of course, the unsung heroes, I always like to point out the horses. They really made the difference. There's no way they would have got through the mountains without the horses. They might have got as far as maybe Lost Trail, and then I think they've been scratching their head going, I think we better go back to the Great Falls. They would have never made it to the Pacific. So that's it. Um, come on out and see us at uh, Traveler's Rest. There's a whole bunch of new, other stories that we can share with you. Um, these are my go to P. This is kind of like my footnotes. Um, these are the, the people that I've, I've gleaned a lot of information off of. Joe Musselman, Gary Moulton, Donald Jackson, Dan Flores. They're all, they're all up there. Sarah Scott, Tony Incasciola. Um, anyway, there's, uh, these are the people I refer to a lot. So with that, I think we better close her up. I didn't see anybody nod off too bad. Good job. I'm going to take questions. Yes, sir. Everybody just raise your hand and I'll bring the microphone. Does anybody have any information about the name of Missoula? It's not an English or a European name. It's an Indian name of some kind. Don't know which tribe it came from. But somebody told me that it might be from the folks up at the uh, Flathead as they would come up over the hills to come down into the valley here to collect bitter roots, there'd be an over, what do you call it? Uh, uh, all the clouds are on the ground. What do, you, what do you call that? Inversion. An inversion, yeah, it was an inversion. All the clouds are on the, on the ground, and they were up in the sunshine. The sun was shining off the clouds. So in their language, they referred to this as the valley where the sky was upside down. <laughs> and, and somehow that turns out to be how they explain it is the word Missoula, I don't know. Any other comments or not? Well, I'm not going to comment too deep on that because it has nothing to do with Lewis Clark. <laughs> yeah, I have to add and 80. I, but um, my friend Kim Bergman has a pretty good idea. He's written articles for the newspaper about it. What I would tell you is it's been the name Mazula sometimes is interpreted as chilly waters. Sometimes the uh, uh, rivers of the little bull trout and the big bull trout. So I don't know. Okay. Well, I've, There's a lot of different theories, I okay. guess, what I'm saying. Well, I've made up my own term for Missoula, too. Missoula is the name of my girlfriend. Her name is Miss Ulala. la <laughs> I'm going to have you come out and, uh, with me, and you can warm the audience up. Robert... Could you give a guess of the streams and rivers that Lewis and Clark named? How many of those streams and rivers still have those names? I'd have to do some research, but there's still a lot of them. Um, but for instance, Montour, Siemens Creek is now Montour Creek. Uh, the Clearwater River up by Clearwater Junction is was Warner's Creek. Um, so they were naming most of their creeks and rivers after the men in the, the, the uh, core of discovery. But I think they ran out of men, and that's why they named Siemens Creek after the dog. <laughs> um, they didn't name all of them. So, um, you know, uh, Lewis names the the... Marias after his supposedly future girlfriend, Maria. And uh, Clark names the Judith after Judith. I think, is it Hancock? Judith? I can't remember the last name. Julia. Yeah, but her name was Julia. So it kind of gets convoluted. I, I'll do a little work for you, Robert. I can look that up. I can, I can do a rough study. Okay, you covered the, uh, the entire cap. We got the Jefferson, the Madison, down the board. All the important people got, got names. <laughs> yeah, they did. They did. Notice that they made the most important river that went into the mountains, Jefferson's River. And 
Lewis was on the other side of the mountain. Today's salmon was called Lewis's River. Lewis meets Jefferson at the divide. Um, when they were selecting men, did they ask whether the men could read and write, do mapping, do those special skills that the Lewis and Clark uh, Corridor Discovery are famous for? Uh, no, they didn't take an SAT. Um, Clark, Clark, was, Clark was the cartographer and really the only one. And that was one of the reasons Lewis hired him, asked him to be his co-partner. Um, but a lot of the men were, yeah, the, all the sergeants were required to write in their journals. Private White House did. So a lot of those men were very literate. Um, one of the requirements were they weren't supposed to be married, but one of them was. I can't remember which one it was, but they, they weren't to be married. Shields. Shields was the blacksmith. Yeah. Yes, sir. Bruce, excellent presentation. I read somewhere that Jefferson told Lewis, when you're out there meeting the tribes, see if you find any Indians who speak Welch. Beca oh. Because he had read supposedly about a Welch expedition in the 13th century that yeah. went up the Mississippi, and he was afraid the British would have a premier claim to ours through that. I did yeah. notice in your I noticed in your presentation that um, one of the names for the tribes, or it says many names, was Lost Tribe of Welshmen. They thought, I was yeah, ask about that. that. That's exactly the story. They were looking for these lost tribe of Welshmen all the way up the rivers. When they got to the Salish, you remember they said, well, these are really a, kind of a handsome people. They kind of thought they might be related to the Welshmen. Really did. So he, Lewis speaks of that in his journals that this must be the lost tribe of the Welshmen. Well, they weren't. I mean, the Salish were misnamed more than any other tribe. They were called... Uh, the Shailees, that's the closest. The Tushapas, the Utlashuts, the Lost Tribe of Welshmen. Uh, they were just so, oh, the Flatheads. That, that was where the Flathead name came from. All those are totally wrong. Salish. Anybody else? I saw you raise your hand a while ago. Did I skip you? About where they turned around at Hellgate? Yeah. They didn't want anything to do with it. Uh -oh. I, had, I, I was very curious when you were talking about the horses. It, it, originally, the horses came from the United States, or from the, this country here, or this North con America. North America. Yeah. But the, and those were wild. They weren't domestic horses, they were all wild. Now, when they went over to Europe, they were not anymore in a wild condition. They were all under control of owners, were they not? Well, they got domesticated around 5,000. Yeah, they domesticated. Yeah, yeah. BC. At, in Europe, they got domesticated. Yeah, so and, about 5,000, yeah, and 7,000 um, years ago. Today. So there weren't any necessarily wild herds of horses there in Europe so much. They were all under some con human control. Well, they, they got here, ten th they got to Asia 10,000 years ago. Yes. So they were out of control for quite a while. Even in Asia? Even in Asia. Okay. They and migrated it, all the way to Africa. Yeah. But then uh, when the, but had they disappeared from this continent then? Yes. And so they were brought back by the Europeans. Yes. And But then when they came back here, they were, they were all under human control. Were they not, and not wild out on the ranges? <laughs> well, you know, horses get loose. And when they, I've got a herd of horse. I live out in Miller Creek. I've got a herd of wild horses out there now from an old rodeo string. And and they haven't been, they, they've got no rope on them. So nobody owns them. They were abandoned. They're in BLM land, and they're 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 wonderful to watch. But um, horses get wild real fast.
You are so kind, sir. One last question for you and anybody else in the audience. Uh, I'm with the Montana Society Sons of the American Revolution, and I wonder if anybody has ever heard of any Revolutionary War veteran who lived long enough to make it to the Montana Territory before they passed away. Because there was Manuel Lisa and a whole bunch of other fur trappers that led expeditions, but we've never documented any. I can't answer that. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, thank you. Thank you.